Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure CES. Well, I'm happy to be back with everybody again today. Uh, we got Brother Ben and Sister Renee here as, as usual. Looks like the chat room is already quite active and eager. So uh, I'm excited. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the last several programs that we've had on CES, whether it's Friday, Wednesdays, and Sundays, um, I think we, I don't want to say that we perfected it, but the programs have been so good. I've just been elated about everything. The, the, the discussion and the, uh, the activity in the chat room, everything has been perfect. So I'm just very thankful for that. Uh, Renee, you want to say hi to everybody? Oh, if you insist. Hey there, everybody. Uh, happy New Year. I'm just so happy to be with you guys today. Uh, we were just talking earlier. What uh, amazing people we have. It's a small little congregation, but we are so supportive of one another. And I'm so grateful to have you all. So I'm excited about having the program today. Okay. And Brother Ben. Yes, likewise, I'm also happy to be here again today. I think we have a good set of questions, a, a couple of really challenging ones. Um, so I hope you guys can answer them because <laughs> some are kind of stumpers. Uh, but no, I'm teasing. Um, yeah, I think we have a good, good uh, service lined up, so it's good to be here. Well, um, I, I can answer every question. You, there's not one question you can ask me about the Bible that I, I cannot answer. Um, but sometimes the answer is, I'm sorry, I just don't know. I'm not, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. And, and th that was an attempt at humor, but it's also a, a truth. We, no, we don't necessarily know. I don't know anybody that really knows it all. Some people probably think and espouse that they do know it all, but um, I don't think we do. And I think it's wise uh, for us to be willing to admit, admit that. Uh, okay, let me see. I don't have any announcements in mind. Renee, uh, any announcements you want to make? I do. I'm sorry. It's something that stuck on my screen there. I couldn't get my mouse to work again. Uh, as you guys know, we had special guest Gary Wayne on last Thursday. If you missed that, he's the author of Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, over 25 years of research, uh, just an amazing guest. Um, if you haven't seen that, go to my channel. It was uh, last Thursday night, Thursday Theological Throwdown. Last year, I had that as a weekly live stream. This year, I was on hiatus for a few months, but this year, I'll probably do uh, two uh, programs a month on Thursday. I'm not going to commit myself fully to a weekly live stream, but I want to do more of, uh, we will have some panels, but I like having special guests to discuss special uh, situations and specific doctrines. This Thursday, January 14th, I'm having special guests. Chris Date. Uh, now, he and I disagree on some things. Uh, however, we happen to agree on the perishing of the wicked. So he discusses how eternal conscious torment became the more popular doctrine of the church, why, why it came to be versus what the Bible actually says happens to the lost, that they suffer the second death, they perish. Uh, and then he explains the verses people use to support uh, conscious torment for all eternity. He believes in something that I believe, which is conditional immortality, that not everyone is immortal. Uh, only those in Christ are immortal, have eternal life so that those that are lost, they do not have immortality. They will surely die twice dead plucked up by the roots. So he discusses this. Now, if you are someone that believes in eternal conscious torment, you are my brother or sister in Christ. As long as you trust Christ, you believe the gospel. This is not something that divides us. I just want to bring him on because he is a, an excellent, uh, he specializes in rethinking 
hell. And I, I do believe this doctrine has been a stumbling block for many people because it, it it's against our very sense of what's just uh, and against God's character as we know it. So I think it's important to listen and hear each other out, especially if the entire argument is based on scripture, not on philosophy. So he's not going to come on saying, well, it doesn't seem fair to me or this is none of the philosophy. He's only using scripture. And that's what happened to me. My position is because of the Bible, not in spite of it. So it's important that we hear each other out. Uh, nobody's insisting that you believe this way, but it's good that we reason with one another as iron sharpens iron and at least understand why your brother or sister in Christ may have a different position than you. And we can be loving with one another. We can disagree with one another without being disagreeable. And so he's going to come and visit. He is, uh, his channel is called Rethinking Hell. And he is uh, very well versed in this. This is his main point of study. So I'm bringing him to you guys so that you can at least hear the position and understand why some of us actually believe this way. So I'm hoping that you'll come with an open mind and a kind heart, whether you agree with this gentleman or not, just to uh, hear each other out. It'll be a very interesting discussion, regardless of your position. Okay, so that's this Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on my channel, Renee Rowland. Hope to see you there. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to miss it. Um, I've sp spoken to Chris Gate myself in the past, and he's one of the foremost authorities on this subject. Um, uh, when you say some of us in this congregation um, no no longer believe in eternal torment, but that the lost will perish, I think I think that's an understatement. Now, I, uh, when we first started talking about this several years ago, um, uh, it's been discussed many times now over the years, and uh, the feedback that I've observed, and also from the the, the polling that we do on the Friday nights. We, we get to find out when we ask the questions on Friday, uh, everybody gets to vote on it and express their, their position. Um, my conclusion is that it's probably close to 50, 50. Uh, half of us think there's eternal torment and half do not. Uh, so um, uh, if you haven't actually considered whatever your position is, if you have not considered the other point of view, uh, it's wise for you to learn the, the opposing view and honestly consider it. So I, I urge everybody to tune in for that. Um, Brother Ben, do you have some, uh, uh, any announcements? No announcements this week. Okay. All right, very good. Um, oh, I guess I can make an announcement. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a special uh, a thing at the end of the program today. Uh, Brother Hendricks has uh, written and submitted an exhortation for the church. And, and so we will read his exhortation at the end. So make sure you hang, stick around through, for the whole thing. And, and uh, Brother Ben will read his exhortation. Um, okay. Um, prayer needs. Uh, uh, Renee, what prayer needs do you want to tell us about? Well, you know our sister Annette, uh, she's been texting me lately, keeping me updated on her dad. Uh, we thought he was coming home from the hospital, but he's not. So he's still in there. So please pray for Annette Sandrick, um, Sandrock, that's how you uh, spell the last name, her father. Keep her dad in prayer as well as her daughter. Uh, keep them both in prayer for their health. Um, and uh, as always, we lift up Jennifer Petty. We lift up Sister Lisa, a fellow contender for uh, the gospel. All of us here on the panel, uh, Tim Henderson, Lisa Boyce, uh, Edward, all of us that preach and stand up and contend for the true gospel of grace, all of us, we all need prayer uh, because the enemy wants to shut us up. Uh, I want to pray for Lisa Boyce. It looks like her channel may have been 
censored or blocked or something. I'm not sure. Uh, we want to pray for her that her spirits are kept up. Uh, and I also want to keep lifting up Anthony Suarez for his kidney transplant, um, as well as all the saints uh, that struggle with fear, anxiety, OCD, uh, this religious kind of fear and bondage. I want to pray that people grow in grace through the milk of the word and this fear drops off. There are people literally in terror uh, of, of what's coming. And I would suggest it's good to be aware. Okay. It's good to be aware of what's going on, but don't make your, don't make conspiracy your main focus of study. Uh, Paul tells us whatsoever things are good, whatsoever thing are praiseworthy. You know, we want to think on these things, uh, focusing on God and his promises, not on negativity, because God is greater than all these things. And so um, I just I pray that we can all use some wisdom and get comforted by the spirit. I also want to lift up WTOM and his family. Uh, uh, God knows why, but just keep them in prayer as well. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. That was a prayer and a wonderful exhortation, sister. Uh, and I, I certainly say amen to that. Uh, one of the, the things that uh, I think we, I don't want to say all make, but many of us make, I believe, I, I certainly did. Um, after I got saved and really started digging in, really studying the Bible seriously, and I found out about the uh, the Masons and the Illuminati and all, all that subject and found out that, hey, there's these conspiracies that are not only present, but ancient. And it's a, it's a fascinating subject. And so uh, what I did was I really dug in and studied it and got absorbed in it so much that I really, you know, like it says in, in uh, Revelation where a, a church lost their first love. In other words, rather than thinking about Jesus and his love for us and the, the, the gospel, and, uh, you know, you get sidetracked thinking about other things that are way, way, should be way down the list of importance. It's not that we should ignore these subjects, but I would ask, suggest everybody to, to guard against letting it take over and become become your, uh, almost your all, all in all. Um and okay, Brother Ben, uh, um, oh, uh, let me say that uh, the prayer uh, I would ask for is a prayer of, of, of uh, uh, thanksgiving and that uh, I, I just feel completely recovered and really strong. I'm, I'm doing all my exercises that I used to do and I, I don't have any, any fatigue left. I'm, so I'm completely recovered and I just thank everybody for their prayers and I thank the Lord uh, apparently he still has some use for me here. Uh, it's not time to take me. <laughs> so if that's the case, I pray that I will uh, know what the Lord wants me to do, and then I'll be diligent to do it. Uh, Brother Ben, uh, any prayer needs? And also let us know about the chat room, okay? Yeah, the the, ch the prayers I saw the chat room, the first one I saw was Liam's. And uh, Liam, uh, please report that uh, God's answer to that prayer. Luke is pretty much fully restored um, from his... Uh, from uh, coronavirus. Um, and then I also saw Jesus' truth uh, asked us to pray for his family that they need to be saved and his mother has cancer. And I saw that um, Hendricks mentioned that Dylan is in a tough spot. I don't know the details, uh, but w if we could uh, pray for him, that that would be great. That's all I saw in chat. Okay. Chess Champ actually pray prays for a sound mind. All right. Okay then. Um, if that's if that's all of them, uh, let, let's take thirty seconds now, and we ask that the whole congregation pray for all of these needs.
All right, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I guess, uh, Ben, uh, time for the hymns. You have some hymns ready for us? Yes, I do. Do you have any hers also? It's not fair <laughs> to just have hymns. I'm sorry. Just hymns today. I'll work oh. on that.
said that it's um, let it be and make it so. But whatever it is, I say amen. Um, all right. Uh, are we ready for the questions or is there anything I'm forgetting? Yep. Okay, then. Let's go to Brent. Ben, uh, we'll read the questions. I'll go ahead and start us off with the first one, Ben. Okay, the first question is, did Jesus come into the world to save the world, to take away the sins of the world, i.e. John one first John one twenty nine, or do we I'm sorry, or do you believe that Jesus came into the world to save his own, i.e. Romans eight twenty nine? Also, 
My sins were already forgiven at Calvary, although I was not yet saved, question mark. Um, and then, or did it require... Or did it require for me to fully recognize and repent of my sins before believing in Jesus and then receive the forgiveness once saved? Hmm. Okay. I guess it's a three-part question. Renee? Well, I think the key to understanding this is the key to the word repent in regards to salvation. Um, the Bible says, you know, per adventure, God give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Hebrews says, let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Uh, also, repentance towards God and of faith towards Christ. So in regards to salvation, if you have trusted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, paid your sin debt, and gave you eternal life because of the merits of Christ and not your own works, you have repented. You have changed your mind from trusting in your own dead works or dead works of the law or whatever you're doing and have trusted in the work of Jesus Christ. That is repentance for salvation, the acknowledging of the truth that you are guilty under God's law. God's standard is perfection and you will never reach it because all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so you need a savior. Acknowledging that fact and then turning to Christ with faith, trust that his death uh, made an atonement for your sins, purged your sins, and now you belong or born into the family of God that you have repented. Uh, now, you, you hear this repent of your sins to be saved, yet that, that is never mentioned in scripture at all. Um, the reason is, is because sin is defined as transgression of the law. So to repent of sin would be to repent of breaking God's law or just keep the law. So now you're adding keeping the law to Christ. And by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So all the law does is shows us our need for a savior. It doesn't save anyone. Uh, so anybody that says they repented of their sins is deceived. Because that is a daily thing we do. We die daily. We are to acknowledge that we died, were buried, and rose again with Jesus in newness of life on a daily basis. That is how we walk out our faith, as we're saved unto good works, not by good works. So nobody's ever repented of all their sin. There are sins of omission that we don't even know we commit. There's sins we commit in our heart. If you look at a one with lust, you committed adultery. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. So we don't look at ourselves or our own righteousness to be saved at all. We trust in what Jesus did that gave us eternal life. So that is true repentance. So uh, the key here to salvation is knowing you can't save yourself. So the question is, did Jesus come into the world to save the world or take away the sins of the world? Or do you believe Jesus, Jesus came into the world to save his own? Well, people misunderstand that when it, the, Jesus's first coming was to his own. It was to fulfill the promises given to the fathers. That's to the nation of Israel. OK, but it says he died for the whole world. He's not willing any should perish, but all come to what? Repentance. All would change their mind and turn to him in faith. So it's God's will that none perish. He wants everyone saved. Once the nation of Israel rejected him as a whole, a remnant of Israel did believe, that's the apostles and a small election uh, has, of Israel was saved. Then the Gentiles were grafted in to believing Israel, making one new man, one body, in Christ, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither male nor female, rich nor poor, bond nor free. It's all one in Christ. So he came to save everyone that's willing to put their trust in him. The Calvinists believe he only died for the elect. No, he died for everyone. He so loved the world. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Once we trust in what Christ did, we're not called sinners, but saints. And then Paul and the other apostles tell us to walk worthy 
of the vocation wherewith we were called. And the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He won't change his mind. Does that mean the gifts and calling of God are without sin? No, of course not. They're without repentance, meaning they're irrevocable. So uh, God sent his son to die for everyone. But it's through his grace, by his grace, through faith. So you have to receive it by faith. The only reason anybody's lost is because they've rejected Christ. That's it. That's it. That's the only difference between the lost and the saved is one is covered by the blood. The other is not. Um, but yeah, it, God wants everyone saved. He didn't come to just die for certain people. He died for everyone. But if these people reject him, they choose death, not life. Uh, because Jesus gives eternal life to those that are in him by faith. If you reject life, you get death. So uh, that's our choices. Um, and it says, my sins were already forgiven at Calvary, although I was not yet saved. Or did it require me, that that's the uh, repent of your sins. We've already discussed that. Yes, when Jesus died for the sin of the whole world, God's wrath was quenched. His wrath was poured out on Jesus for the sins of the whole world. Before the cross, sins that are past, and after the cross. It says he died once for all. Uh, and the law was a shadow. So they would have to give animal sacrifices year by year continually. And it says those sacrifices could never take away sin. But this man, after all, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Now that is, that's from memory, but it's somewhere in Hebrews. So he paid for the sin of the whole world. Uh, you, Everyone is technically forgiven at the cross, but you have to receive it by faith then you're born of god the moment you believe since god's in eternity he knows the end from the beginning he knows them that are his so um he did technically die for everyone uh but you do have to receive it by faith uh and the key to understanding this is understanding what repentance is in regards to salvation god repented like 38 times in scripture it can be in context of sin, or it can be in context of anything. I could order a salad and repent and get a sandwich. You know, you can change your mind about anything. So, um, although as Christians, once we're saved, uh, if we are tempted by sin, we should repent of that daily, die daily to self so that we can walk in newness of life with Christ. But that's once you're saved. To be saved, repentance is simply to stop trusting in you and trust and rest in what Christ did. All right. Thank you. Okay. There's uh, a lot in this question, Ben. What do you say? Uh, well, I think I'll address it piece by piece. Uh, and I agree with everything that Renee said. Um, so the first part of the question is, did Jesus come into the world to save the world, to take away the sins of the world? Or did he believe, or did you, or do you believe that Jesus came into the world to save his own, i.e. Romans eight twenty nine, which is referring to the to the Jews? Uh, well, I think I, I think he came in to do both. Uh, when Jesus, well, when when John the Baptist came into the world, he his purpose was to prepare the way before the Lord, and I think the way he prepared the way is in the Bible. It refers to people as. Uh, soil essentially or ground if you think there's a lot of uh in, in instances in the bible uh and it's it's consistent where it refers to uh people uh as uh, soil types or ground and i believe john the baptist in in, in his terms of preparate preparing the way of the lord he broke up that fallow ground if you will of the of the hardened jewish people who um were relying on their ethnicity and looked down on others uh, because again, they trusted in their ethnicity, thought they were righteous by birth, essentially, just because they were Jewish, um, or or, or uh, children of Abraham, and that's why uh, John the Baptist and Jesus said, "Do not think that uh, you know that we are. Do not say within yourselves that we are children of Abraham." Um, and I think again, John the Baptist called people to 
he was trying to trying to break up that the heart of their hearts to, re, to get them to recognize no your 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 uh, ethnicity's not going to save you uh and you are a sinner and um and so i think john the baptist's uh uh and jesus early ministry to the jews was kind of uh, dualistic it was both to say the kingdom of god is at hand meaning it's i'm off it's right on the table here if you will accept the king uh, then, then the kingdom will be ushered in. Um, so both John the Baptist and Jesus were, were preaching that, and that, that not only the kingdom of God was at hand, but that Jesus, the king, was here, who was taking away the sins of the world, and even, uh, you know, that they should believe on him who was to come after John the Baptist, which is Christ. So again, I think it's, uh, John the Baptist and Jesus' early ministry was dualistic. And the, their message was, not only is the kingdom at hand, but... Uh, you need to be declared righteous by faith in in the king because unless your uh, righteousness exceeds exceeds the the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will know my in, by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so, uh, I believe when Jesus and John were saying, you know, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Again, the repentance there is, uh, you know, repent of your self righteousness essentially. Um, and the kingdom of God is at hand, or kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's basically, again, he's saying it's right at the door. If you will only accept the king, then the kingdom the kingdom will be ushered in. And uh, and essentially, I, I'm glad that they rejected the king because it had the kingdom come. Um, I may have never been born. We all never may have been born. And I think the gospel uh, would not have been offered to the Gentiles. But God knew that was going to happen ahead of time. So uh, when he offered the kingdom of heaven, uh, it was at hand. I think it was a legitimate offer. It wasn't like he was saying, um, oh, uh, you know, I I'm offering this in, in vain. Like, uh, you know, it's like it's not going to happen. No, it was, he, God, God foreknows man's will, but he won't, again, won't uh, counter a man's will. And their will was to reject the king. And so for that reason, um, that's why he his own rejected him. He came into the world to his own. He came first to his own, but they, his own rejected him. That means his, his, his ethnic Jewish brothers and sisters. They rejected him. God knew that was going to happen, but it was for our, our gain, the Gentiles' gain, uh, ultimately, so that we could be grafted in. And so, yes, in, in, in terms of the question, did Jesus come into the, into the world to save the world and to, and to his own? Both are true. Um, yes, yes and yes. Um, now, with regards to are my sins already forgiven at Calvary, although I was not yet saved, or did it require me to fully recognize and repent of my sins before believing? Well, Rene already addressed the idea of repentance with regards to salvation. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, promising or committing or even trying to uh, stop sinning. It's, it's all with regards to stop trusting in that. Uh, to stop trusting in yourself, have no confidence in your flesh, put your faith fully in, in the completed work of Christ in the person, in his person, being, you know, the son of God, fully man, fully God, and his, um, his provision, his offer of, of eternal salvation, uh, which he purchased for everyone by his own blood. And uh, with regards to when you were forgiven, well, I, I think in the Bible it's important, I think there's kind of two forms of forgiveness, if you will. And I think the first form of forgiveness is judicial forgiveness. And that's why it says, for example, in Romans 3, it says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So again, the law and the prophets witnessed to the, the supreme and complete and perfect righteousness of God. And the, the gospel actually reveals the righteousness of God. It reveals that no one is righteous and God actually had to send his own son to become sin for us because no law could 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 uh, give life. If there was a law that could give life, Christ wouldn't have died in vain. And and so in that respect the 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 the, the gospel itself reveals the righteousness of God that not one jot or tittle by by no means will um uh be erased from the law essentially. Um until this this heaven and earth is passed away, and so because in that when this heaven and earth is passed away, and we have the new the regeneration, 
uh, there will be no no one unrighteous, and so there will be no need for a law. Everyone will be righteous. A law is not made for righteous people, for but for unrighteous people. And so, so in fact, anyone who thinks that they're keeping the law to be righteous, they're they're actually declaring themselves unrighteous, and that's it. They may not know it, but that's exactly what its intent is. Uh, that the law identifies unrighteousness. Um, so, and, and so again, it says, uh, it also in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall, fallen short of the glory of, God, glory of God, being justified. Again, justified is a legal term. It means that you are declared righteous and um, innocent with regards to a violation of God's perfect law. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as a propitiation, which is basically, uh, propitiation means satisfactory satisfactory payment by his blood through faith to, de to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So with regards to being just, uh, God again, God's complete, uh, righteous, all every righteous demand that God had, that God demands uh, of of all, every man uh, was placed on Christ, and Christ fulfilled that justice. And because if you if you believe on Christ, you are included in Christ as part of His body. You're no longer um, seen as God, uh, as in the old man in Adam. You're seen as a new creation in Christ, and so. Uh, because God, because only Christ satisfies God's perfect justice, He is not only just. In fact, you know what it means by just is that God didn't, didn't overlook certain sins and say, "Oh, I'm gonna uh, off." I'm gonna. A lot of people believe that God will show leniency or clemency towards sin, like, "Oh, like, like they're gonna, they're, they want to diminish the righteousness of God's law." No, that's not how God de deals with it. God deals with. Uh, his righteousness, his justice, by being perfectly righteous and just and fulfilling that justice in Christ. And so if you're in him, he is the justifier of you because he fulfilled all the re righteous requirements God pl places on mankind. And and so in that respect, that's where, and so when Christ was crucified before we were born, in that respect, we were judicially uh it judicially made it possible for us to be for, forgiven with respect to the law. But it's not until you believe it, it is when you receive that forgiveness. And that's why uh, there's a verse that says, you know, um, whoever believes in him receives the, the, the forgiveness of sins. So as part of believing, it should be understood, and we should understand and know this, that when we believe, we receive the forgiveness of God. It's not that that's when we were actually judicially forgiven, but that's when we receive it. It becomes part of our identity and that could that's when we're actually included in Christ um, um, and so again uh, and so that's I, when we it's when we believe is when we receive, we receive that forgiveness but judicially we were forgiven as a, technically uh, God made it possible for us to be judicially forgiven at the time of Christ's death um, and and so I think that's important um, uh, I could go into much more about that, but I'll, I guess I think I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Uh, well, as I said, there's a lot uh, to the question, and both Renee and Ben were very thorough. I'll try to be concise. I, I, I agree for the most part. I think I do have a, like a, I don't want to say subtle distinction, but I, there, there's one point that I think you'll see. Um, my conclusion is a little different. Uh, well, I guess like you, I'll start but with a question. The, the, the first part of the question about did he uh, come to save the world, pay for the sins of the world, or just the elect or those who, who get saved? Uh, obviously, this is a Calvinist question. This is one of the <clears throat> main tenets of Calvinism. And this is... Uh, in, in the acronym TULIP, uh, T-U-L-I-P, uh, this would be the third point, uh, the L, a limited atonement. The Calvinist position is that Jesus only died for the sins of the elect, the, the saved people, not for everybody. And uh, many people find that to be the most objectionable 
uh, part of Calvinism. Um, I believe that uh, a, what, what's essential is that each of us believes that Jesus paid for our own sins. And, and as far as paying for everybody's sins or just the elect, uh, is it's not that's not something that is going to make or break uh, you. Uh, but you've got to you got to believe that Jesus died and paid for your sins. Um, but my my position is that um, I, I made a video years ago. I think the title was um, Universal Reconciliation, not Universal Salvation. And so reconciliation and salvation are not the same thing. They're not interchangeable terms. Reconciled means that you're at peace. You're not uh, mad at each other anymore. And um, and salvation, of course, is different in that hey you're you're not condemned you're you're and you're and we we think think of salvation as also um you have eternal life even though they're really they're different things but if we say we're saved we know that okay uh we don't have to go to hell pay for our sins and we get to go to heaven and have eternal life that's what we think of when we we think of being saved uh, but when i say universal reconciliation i i do believe that the scriptures that say um, uh, and Christ died for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's propitiation. Uh, propitiation, it's expressed a lot of ways. Uh, many people have said it means paid in full. It's satisfaction. God's satisfied. And when it says the whole world, I, I believe that it, it really means that, that everybody's sins have been paid for, and therefore it's I guess the the example I would say is that uh, the when when Jesus died, I mentioned this I think last week too that um, there was an earthquake and the temple was shaken and the uh, the um, barrier between the the public area and the uh, uh, the holy of holies the um, uh, the back area where the public was not allowed only the high priest was allowed there that's where the ark of the covenant was and uh, that represented where God was. Well, there was a curtain between those two areas, and that curtain symbolized um, the, the separation between man and God. Man uh, did not have access to God, and God, and God could not have fellowship with man because sin was the problem. Sin was a barrier. The sin was the estrangement. That's why we we're estranged and couldn't have a relationship with God. So, at the earthquake, at Jesus' death, the curtain was torn in half from top to bottom, bottom, and there was the, now the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, is exposed to the public. Everybody can see it. So that represented that the 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 barrier that separated man and, and God has been removed. It's it's done. It's accomplished. As Jesus said, it is finished. I think that's what he meant when he said it is finished. I paid for all the sins. Sin is not a barrier anymore. There's no reason why man and God cannot have a relationship because the sin barrier is removed. Um, so I think that we have universal reconciliation and that everybody's sins are forgiven and paid for, but um, we don't have universal salvation um, in, in that uh, we, we lack one thing. Uh, even though our sins are paid for, we lack eternal life. And the Bible says that... Uh, I think it's Romans 3, 23. Uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the, one of the things that, that they'll be going into great detail in Renee's program coming up next Thursday is the idea of um, uh, do, do we um, naturally, uh, inherently, uh, innately have eternal life? Or is man immortal? Will... will does man live on forever after death, uh, as, as our soul? Uh, that's the um, the Greek the, um, uh, Platonic uh, view. Plato popularized it, and Christianity embraced it. Is that we all have an immortal soul? But the Bible says that that uh, uh, we we are mortal, and we must put on immortality. So we don't. Uh, we're not naturally immortal. We have to receive immortality. We have to receive eternal life from Jesus Christ. So in spite of the fact that Jesus paid for our sins, 
we still have the problem of we don't have eternal life until we receive it from Jesus Christ. Um, so I think that is a, a different viewpoint uh, than uh, others hold, but um, I don't have any problem with someone um, thinking that, uh, well, he paid for the sins, but it doesn't apply to you until you believe. Um, I'm okay with that, even though I think that the sins are already, it's already been completely resolved. What we receive with faith is eternal life, not forgiveness of sins. It's all that's done. But we did have a dispute at CES uh, because someone was teaching that you must understand and believe in this distinction that um, your, your sins uh, were not forgiven uh, the moment you believed. That's, that was what was being promoted. But instead, your sins were, were forgiven at the cross. I happen to believe that's true. The sins were forgiven at the cross. Um, but uh, someone was making a big deal of that, saying that if you don't understand this distinction, and if you don't believe correctly, then you are not truly saved. So that's taking this too, too far. It's, it's a deep theological position that I think requires uh, a lot of un more understanding than um, uh, they would argue that, well, if you don't understand that, you have superficial kind of faith. You don't understand deeply enough. Um, but... Um, yeah, I think that uh, the, the sins um, were already paid for. And uh, when you believe, uh, of course, if you think that, well, that's when I, my sins were forgiven, there's no problem with that. That's certainly okay uh, in my book, and uh, I would not object to, to that. Uh, the, um, the other, let me see, the other part of the question is, um, did it require to fully recognize and repent of my sins? Well, everybody's covered it all already about the repentance of sins is not necessary for salvation. Um, uh, even repenting of sins is not necessary for fellowship, as some interpret First John. Uh, uh, I believe that um, if that was necessary, if God would not have fellowship with us, if we did not repent of all our sins, what about all the sins that we don't even remember or not even aware of, these unknown sins? Uh, that's why there was a a sacrifice in Judaism for the unknown sins, uh, because we we're certainly not even aware of all the sins that we we have on our our account. And since, of course, since sin is not an issue anymore, then that's also uh, uh, changes um, how I understand this. Uh, but um, we know that in the KJV that repent of your sins. That particular phrase is not in the Bible. Um, now, does the Bible never talk about repenting of sins? No, that's not what we're saying. It is appropriate to forget it, repent of our sins, but we don't have to do it to get saved. We don't have to do it to restore fellowship, but it is healthy to do it, to let God know, uh, and to uh, get it all off of our conscience so that we, we're not, we're not uh, feeling guilty. Uh, so uh, many people feel a great relief to, you know, uh, continually, uh, as it says in First John uh, 1, 9, I think it says, um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's true. But I don't think that should be applied to the believer. Uh, that should be, that's, that's something we tell the non-believer. Hey, you need to confess you're a sinner. And when you confess you're a sinner, and, and you, you, you have this, you have, understand that, oh, I need a savior. Well, Jesus Paid for your sins, and 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 uh, uh, you're, you're, you will be cleansed of all your unrighteousness. So I say I believe that part of First John one nine is directed to the people who are attending church that day, who are not believers, just like in our audience right now. I think most of the people listening to us right now in this congregation are saved, but maybe we have some people who are not saved. Maybe you're you you had a family member attend today and. Uh, and they don't know the gospel. So it's important that in, in every church service, we're not only talking to the believers, but we have to think some people may not believe. So we have to rem remind them that about the sin problem and that Jesus paid for our sins. Um, then let me see. Yeah, I, I think I covered the, the three, th three parts of that uh, question. Um, all right, uh, any more, Renee or, or Ben? That was a lot. That one question had so many pieces to it. 
Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was good. Everybody answered it great. Yeah. Yeah, we could easily uh, take all that one question and do the entire program or more. We we've actually could do, probably do a series of videos <laughs> on it, uh, have a playlist just on that one uh, question. All right, Ben, any more? Uh, no. Okay. All right, then. I guess well, let's go to the next question, Ben. All right. The next question is, and I'm hoping you guys can step up on this because <laughs> I, didn't, I, I uh, don't have any problems uh, with... Um, thinking that Jesus uh, is in the line of Mary, but I, I haven't started it out, um, so hopefully you guys uh, have. Um, so the question is, how was Jesus from the line of David if Mary was from the tribe of Levi and Joseph was from the line of David, tribe of Judah? Technically, Jesus didn't have Joseph's seed, and didn't they use, didn't they use blood lines to determine lineage? I understand Jesus was a legal descendant, through adoption but not by blood correct does that matter scripturally in terms of the messianic prophecies jewish people say that the tribal lineage is only traced through a person's father never the mother did scripture ever say the messiah had to be blood born of david Okay, so Ben, uh, you said that you're not studied on this. Does that mean you'd rather not go first, or do you want to go I, first? Well, I definitely wouldn't want to go first. I have, um, I've heard, you know, I've heard this objection before, and I've read very satisfactory answers, and so I kind of like, you know, it was never really a, a, a sticking point for me, so I said, okay, yeah, that's, I, I you know, I, I was never uh, <laughs> suspicious that Jesus did, wasn't truly qualified mm -hmm. to be either the son of God or the rightful thorn of David. So I, uh, it never bothered me. So I haven't really studied out the, 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 you know, the jot and tittle of, of every le legal, uh, ramification, but, um, maybe you guys have. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, Renee, have you studied this? Do you, are you familiar with this? Yes, I am. But I was pretty clear that Mary also was from the line of David. I'm trying to look it up. I know that there are a couple of ways that it's mentioned where they think when it says uh, a virgin was married, uh, that she was promised to from the line of David. Uh, and that's why he went to Bethlehem. And they think only Joseph was from the line of David. But I'm pretty sure her lineage is also uh, connected to David. And I'm trying to see if I can find that off the top of my head. I studied this years ago, so I can't have it right now. But I need to go look real quick if you give me time. Okay. Um, all right. I'll go ahead and go first. But my question is going to be kind of vague. Uh, I did uh, take some time because we, we recently we started actually getting the questions in advance so that if there's a complicated question or something that we uh, maybe needed to uh, brush up on that we had an opportunity to do it. So what I did on this question was I I researched it uh, and also I watched uh, numerous videos uh, on this subject. And I will say that um, it I, I'm perfectly satisfied that we don't have a problem. But to t explain it, this is so complex that um, I, I I would encourage everybody to. Uh, just uh, search on YouTube for videos on uh, the discrepancy between uh, uh, the genealogies in uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, and you'll see that there's a lot of videos that have been made about this, and there's a lot of really interesting arguments on this. But uh, I, I will say a couple of things here. Um, the, the simplest uh, answer is that... Um, we, we have genealogies from, from both parents of Jesus, uh, Joseph and Mary, and that uh, uh, Luke gives us uh, Mary's genealogy and Matthew gives us uh, Joseph's genealogy. If I remember correctly, uh, Matthew uh, starts with Abraham because it's directed to the Jews. Uh, and it's written for the Jewish audience, so it begins with Abraham and, and brings us uh, the genealogy all the way up to Jesus to show his, his he's the uh, in the the proper line to fulfill the prophecies. But uh, Luke uh, goes backwards. I think it starts with Jesus and works his way back all the way to Adam. Uh, and, and, and that was to show, because that's 
Luke has written written for the to the world, is a Gentile audience, so that it's to show that uh, look, his genealogy he will trace it all the way back to, to, to Adam. Uh, the um, but there is a, a question about um, um, the um, there's a discrepancy, apparent discrepancy with Joseph, uh, the who is this the father of Jesus, not in a physical sense, but the let's say the adopted father of Jesus, uh, and, and uh, Joseph. It, it seems that he he has two different in the accounts. He his father are two different people. And that has been answered. Uh, it's really very complex. Uh, if I tried to explain it to you, I wouldn't do a good job. And uh, you probably wouldn't follow it, even if you, you'd probably have to watch the videos I've watched numerous times to even begin to keep up with it. Uh, but there are some good explanations as to why that uh, the, uh, apparently uh, in one account, um, Joseph has a, a father uh, that has a particular name and a different genealogy. And then uh, the other one, Joseph's father's different name and has a different genealogy. But uh, uh, th this is a question that is ancient too. This is not a new uh, problem that to, to, to try to resolve. I found that if, as far back as Eusebius, he wrote uh, uh, a, a, quite a bit on this to, to answer this uh, problem. So um, that's, I guess, um, there's a lot of details that I could be giving you, but I don't think I do a very good job. And and so you need to research as I did. And I think you'd be satisfied that we don't have a, a problem. And I do agree, Renee, that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mary's genealogy is uh, also traced back as to David. It's not... Uh, they're, they're wrong to say Levi. The reason they say Levi is because Elizabeth, is from the line of Levi, but Elizabeth was her aunt. So I believe that Mary's father does go back to the tribe of Judah. I don't have it right here, uh, uh, but maybe I'll do a video on it. But a lot of people assume because Mary was related to Elizabeth and apparently she was from the line of Levi because of Zechariah being the Levitical priest. So I'm not even sure if Elizabeth herself is from the line of Levi or just her husband was. But in any case, even if Elizabeth is from the line of Levi, uh, she's just Mary's aunt. And we would go by, I believe, Mary's father. And I think Mary's father does go back to the tribe of Judah um, as well as Joseph's. So I believe both of them have blood lineage back to David. Um, I will have to there's no like one verse that proves that. So I'd have to go back and research it. But I believe the reason people say Mary's from Levi, she's not, is because of Elizabeth. Because Elizabeth is married to Zachariah and he's obviously a Levitical priest because he's the priest that the angel appeared to and was struck dumb because he didn't believe the angel. So uh, I do not believe Mary is from Levi. I believe she is from Judah. Um, and I I did something years ago on this study. I do not have everything now, but I do believe Mary's father uh, goes back to the line of Judah. Maybe I'll do a video on it. But in any case, uh, I do not believe that Mary is from Levi. I do believe both of them can trace their lineage back to Judah. And it would confirm the governor. God's not a liar. Uh, it would confirm the promise that it would be through the line of David. So um, Mary, Mary, uh, Mary's side does trace back to Judah. There's no way God's a liar. Yeah. Uh, th th this question, as I said, uh, it, to do it justice, uh, this is not really the right kind of format uh, where we're trying to answer it as, as in a, in a briefly and in, in the time allowed. This is something that would require, and uh, to, to do it justice would require uh, several hours at least. And uh, so I suggest you you research it and you'll see that. It, why is it important though? Why it is a legitimate question that, that I think is uh, everybody should uh, be, uh, make an attempt to, uh, to reconcile because otherwise we have the Bible contradicting itself in a discrepancy and, it, and, and people would charge that the Bible can't be trusted if you, so that's, this is why it is important. And, and but there are good answers. Uh, ben, what do you say? Yeah, it's
Mary's father, I believe, that can we assume that her father was from Judah. Elizabeth it, Elizabeth is just an aunt. Well, uh, I, I did research this quite a bit. Uh, this probably 10 years ago, and that's why I'm, I don't remember all the details. And because, again, you know, Satan and, and uh, everyone who poses Christianity, they'll, they'll, they attack every everything they can. And they talk, they attacked every little relationship that Jesus had to uh, and right to the Davidic throne and, and all that, all that. And I remember researching that and a couple of good sites I remember leveraging. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not recommending these, these sites for their soteriology, but just for general apologetics uh, is tectonics.org. That's T E K. T O N I C S dot org. Uh, they had some good materials on it. Um, another one's called Apologetics Press. That's one word, no spaces or anything else. dot uh, org. Apologetics Press dot org. Uh, again, I think they're very lordship, but uh, they have good again, just general apologetics materials. Um, and I, 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 I recalled a bunch of resources too. And, and again, I, I thought it was a, a great, actually, faith building exercise because you, you would, they traced back all these little minute details in the Old Testament. And it was just like, it was obviously divine how, how you know, not even a, a man could come up with such an intricate story uh, and, and, and to preserve it and to have it uh, unfold over thousands of years. It, it was just amazing. So it, it, I would recommend going into this, just studying it for the, faith building building it can do um but also is that we have to take it by faith anyways because we don't have access to these uh, genealogies and in fact i've heard it said um that they kept the jews kept the genealogies in the temple and after 70 a.d all these genealogies were just destroyed so no one coming after jesus now could claim to be right rightfully to be the messiah because they can't they can't trace back their genealogy like it needs to be traced back um, and, uh, and it's interesting that Jesus said that, you know, if to the, to the unbelieving generation of Jews that, you know, if someone comes in his own name, he, you will believe, but not someone who comes in, in the name of the father. Um, and so I, I, I believe this, this false Christ, uh, will come in his own name and, and probably not have any gene genealogy to fall back on. He just says, I, I, I he, he's speaking it from his own authority. Um, and, and, and not only in a natural sense, but a, uh, you know, in a, in a spiritual sense. Um, so anyways, yeah, I, again, we have to take it by faith anyways. I, and it was, again, there's, there's not a problem here at all. In fact, I think if you, if you research it, it'll be, uh, a, a great, uh, exercise in, um, building up your faith and just recognizing the intricacy and the complexity of God's word and that it could not have unfolded. Uh, I don't care how crafty man could, could try to be. There's no way it could unfold it the way it could have over thousands of years. All right. Okay. Are we done with that? Renee, any more? Yeah, I was going to say, um, it is, I believe it's off the top of my head, it's assumed that Mary's father was from the line of Judah as well. Uh, I think people get this Levi thing, again, because they know uh, Elizabeth. But Elizabeth was either her aunt or her cousin, uh, and that that doesn't prove anything. If God says that the lineage is through Judah, it's clear it was through Judah. And I believe Mary and Joseph were both from the line of David. They can trace their descendants back to him. So I, if God says it, it's true. And whether it shows us everybody's lineage uh, clearly or says flat out, Mary's father was from here. Uh, if God says it's so, it's so. So I believe that Mary's father, and that's what most um, uh, scholars have thought, that the father of Mary uh, was can trace his descendants to the line of David. So uh, I'd have to go through, I hate doing that, it's so boring, uh, all the genealogy list. What are you wearing, Luke? <laughs> what, do you, what do you got on? They're going to call you a Satanist, Luke, because you're wearing a black hooded robe. I'm I'm. Uh... I'm becoming mon monastic. I'm withdrawing. I'm going to just be by myself from now on. I see. <laughs> Gosh, I can't even think. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I think Mary's from the line of David because her father is from the line of David. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, is so convincing that the Bible is the word of God are fulfilled prophecies. And the 
there are numerous prophecies uh, in the, the Old Testament uh, about the coming Messiah, about the uh, who would be the, from Abraham. Uh, it, God promised that his lineage would produce this Messiah. And, uh, and then certain people are mentioned through the scripture. You got Abraham is mentioned, Isaac, uh, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, and David. These are the ones that are mentioned. And so uh, the, and then the people have calculated the odds, uh, for example, particularly with uh, uh, Jacob and, and uh, Judah, because Jacob had 12 sons. So that's one chance out of 12. But if you if you figure out the odds of each one of these and then multiply it out, it, it's really overwhelming uh, the statistical probability of any one person fulfilling the, all of these uh, uh, requirements that uh, we find in the prophetic scriptures. And then the, the, the New Testament, we have this account, uh, in these two accounts of the genealogy, and that's why it's there really to to show us that hey the, the prophecies have been fulfilled here's his genealogy and yet we have two of them well one's through mary the other's through joseph and of course joseph wasn't his physical father but his uh adopted father but he still has considered to be uh, have all the rights uh that would come with, with that so it's also a valid but it's it's um provably true that both of the ge genealogies uh, satisfy the the prophecies um, okay, uh, Ben, let's go to the next question. Okay. Next question is, what advice would you guys have for someone who is just starting out in ministry? Also, in what ways can one hear clearly what their calling is? All right, Ben, will you go first on this? Yeah, um... Well, I, I do believe, I think you've said this before, Luke, that every every believer has a ministry. Uh, it, it may take different um, forms, um, and you know, you might pro provide different services, or so to speak, or you might serve in a different way, but we all we all have a ministry. Um, and so I, I don't think it's um, that, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a clear call that we all have. And so it's not something we should wonder at, it's something that we, we do have. Uh, and so, and then I definitely, I think, believe God has given uh, believers different spiritual uh, gifts to fulfill that ministry. And it's not meant to be, um, you know, uh, uh, served out alone. We're supposed to be uh, leaning on each other and uh, ministering together to each other and inwardly and outwardly uh, to unbelievers. So uh, inwardly to each other and then outwardly to unbelievers. So, um just who is someone who's just starting out in ministry i, I would say the advice I, I would have is first of all is uh before you really go out and, and try to you know, take on too much um study stu study to show yourself approved and by studying i mean and, and, and to, by showing yourself approved is can can you can read the bible and uh harmonize passages that seem like they're contradictions but they're not uh can you can you defend strongly your position against uh heresies like lordship salvation for example um you know can you can you come up with the passage uh you know can you come up with a, a strong defense i believe uh against people who would try to twist scripture out of context um that that i guess that's probably more for someone who's who's teaching in a teaching position uh but i think we all should be you know again studying to show ourselves approved uh, we, we, you know, it's not like, I think a lot of people, especially nowadays, will lean too way too much on watching YouTube videos all day. Uh, I think, I think it's fi perfectly fine to learn from other people, but some people, that's their sole source of, of learning God's word is listening to others. Um, uh, not only reading others word, but, you know, listening to their videos and et cetera. And I think it's extremely, extremely important to, uh, read the Bible yourself. And you might not all you might not understand it at all at first. In fact, I think at first it can be extremely frustrating. At least it was for me because I didn't understand uh, it, the Bible is written you know in a way that's counter to the flesh. You know, it's it's it God's word, our spirit, and so it's counter to a lot of things that we assume. And people read it kind of in their flesh, and they try to apply uh, carnal principles to it. It doesn't work. 
the the Bible truly does define itself. It has its own language. Um, and you know, if you think about it, if if an alien culture landed on planet Earth and they spoke a different language, they would have to start with the basics about you know what their words meant and, and before they could develop into more higher level uh, communications. And I think that's exactly what the Bible does. And that's why it's important to read it from the beginning. And whenever a new concept is introduced for the first time in the Bible, that's is where you're usually going to find how it's defining that term or principle, like the word seed, for example. Uh, you know, yes, there, there's a physical physical seed in the Bible, but there's also, also obviously a, a spiritual seed. And we learn later that the, the spiritual seed is the word of God, for example. Um, and so, um, and so, for example, I know that people in early Genesis think that there's a serpent seed and a, 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 a godly seed, and that certain certain people are, you know, basically are are born under Satan, are Satan's her father, and, and God's uh, the other uh, believer's father, um, and from a from a from a physical uh, uh, genealogical geological genealogical perspective. Uh, again, I think that serpent seed doctrine is dangerous and, and false. Um, and I think that, what, again, even in Genesis, is talking about a spiritual seed. That's why Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. Not that Satan actually uh, procreated them, but no, they, they are reflecting. In fact, in the Bible, when it talks about like father, actually, this is a perfect example. The Bible uses it often, very often, like you are the father of or son of, things like that. Yes, obviously, there's obviously times where in the context, it tells you that this person was actually, you know, uh, the, the, the physical father of another person. But often, uh, when it talks about it, like in the New Testament especially, it's referring to that you, like when it says, like, uh, you, we are uh, Abraham's children, for example, or uh, Abraham's our father. It means that we are reflecting the character of the first person in the Bible that 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 is documented to have reflected that character. So Abraham was kind of like the first person that really, uh, or the chief person that exercised faith in God and and His promise. Um, and that's why it says, like for example, Jesus said to the Pharisees, "You are of your father the devil." Well, it's because that they wanted to murder a man. They wanted to murder Jesus, and and Satan was the first murderer in the Bible. He wanted, he tried, he he killed man. He murdered man, so to speak, with God's law by making them weak under the law and breaking that relationship they had with the Spirit. And so, and that's why it says in the Bible also too, like another puzzling passage, like uh, you know, something like I make, I'm paraphrasing, and I probably don't have this right, but like uh, you know, uh, Tubal Cain uh is the father of all who who uh you know have uh uh. Uh, that uh, have a gift in musical arts. Again, it doesn't mean that he was a physical father. Is that he was the first person in the Bible that reflected that character to have a, a special uh, skill um, with musical arts, for example. I don't think it was Tubal Cain, but I, 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 think, I think you get the point. So again, the Bible defines its own terms, and um, I think it's important to really spend a lot of time understanding what the the the, the how, Bi how the Bible defines itself so that you could uh, decode, if so to speak, uh, passages that are, are that seem to, be, seem to be contradictory or people twist uh, out of context. I think that's extremely important. I, I definitely made that mistake. Um, again, I, I, I was, as a new believer, I was had a lot of zeal for the Lord, and then I kind of fell into, um, oh, I wanted to start evangelizing. So I, I, I got Ray Comfort's uh, uh programs to learn about how to uh, evangelize according to the way of the master. And then I fell into all kind of false doctrine. It didn't last long. It didn't fool me for long, but it was enough to almost kill me. Um, and so, again, I went out and made, I, I taught, a, I preached a false gospel for a while. And it, I, I have a great, I have a lot of grief over that. And so, um, again, I think it's important to, First, get yourself grounded firmly in the grace of God. And it's only when you are firmly grounded in the grace of God can you uh, not only manifest this, the gifts of the Spirit uh, and the fruit of the Spirit, but it's only then where you can help others. Otherwise, if you're if you're if you're concerned that you're going to constantly uh, fall into condemnation or lose your salvation, well, you're going to be self-centered. You're not really going to be serving others. You're going. It's all going to be tainted with. Uh, again, sin uh, or self-preservation. 
You're not you're not doing it out of selflessness or pure grace. You're doing it out of law principles, and and uh, again, it, it's it's no good. Um, and so how come you know what our calling is? For me personally, um, it, it's only when I kind of gave up on trying to figure out what my calling was or how I should serve did I think God really answer that prayer. Um, because for me, again, I, I was kind of a lone wolf for a long time trying to trying to crank out the Christian life up by my own power and out of my own flesh. And I was utterly confused, doing everything on my own, uh, not having fellowship with anyone. And it's only when I kind of gave up on that completely and had, was in, in despair and just called out to God and cried out to God, show mercy, you know, uh, have mercy on me. Not that he was withholding his mercy, but he needed me to realize that I couldn't do it on my own at all in any respect, not only for salvation, but even just living the Christian life moment by moment. It's only then where all this grace was kind of like, uh, it just all happened. It fell into place naturally. Like I, I, I started fellowshipping, fellowshipping with Luke and coming into this ministry. And, uh, you know, I, I never thought for a second or it was never my motivation even for a second to come on these panels and start, you know, uh, participating on a regular basis. I love doing it, but um, I was asked to do it and I get it. I just, I think it's something that God just opened up for me. Um, so it's not something that I, I um, sought to do myself. I, I let I, I think it's important to allow God to show you these things, to open the doors for you, and I, it'll be effortless. You just fall right in line. So I'm sure you, uh, Renee and Luke have much more uh, profound things to say about it, but um, that's my early experience. All right. Thank you, Brother Ben. Renee, you have something really profound to say? You put me on the spot. All right, so the question is, what advice would you guys have for someone who's just starting out in ministry? Also, in what ways can one hear clearly what their calling is? All right, well, I would have to agree with Ben to study to show thyself approve a workman, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth so that you're not ashamed, okay? And he's right on that. Uh, in addition, First Peter tells us to have an answer for the hope we have. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So <clears throat> we should have, see, God tells us to reason together with him. We don't just have blind faith like the atheists say. We have faith based on evidence. Uh, we have studied God's word. We've studied the history. We've studied the apostles and how they responded to his resurrection. We've studied all these things and we're convinced by the evidence that Jesus did rise from the dead and did everything he promised he would do. And therefore he is who he says he is and is trustworthy that we can have the promise of eternal life because he himself rose from the dead. Uh, as brother Luke says, raised again for our justification. I think it's resurrection uh, justified our faith that gave us a strong reason for it. In, a, in addition, if you go over to Ephesians chapter four, he talks about the different things, uh, uh, gifts that people have. Ben was correct in saying that we don't have to wonder because his one great commandment to every Christian is to preach the gospel to every creature. We don't have to wonder if, if we're supposed to do that. Every Christian is supposed to tell others about the good news of what Christ accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection on Calvary. That is something everyone is supposed to do. Again, I would agree with Ben saying it's good to watch videos. If you have someone you trust to watch the videos to help guide you along, but to go to the scriptures, check everything they say, including myself, check everything I say in context, in the scriptures, and go to God yourself with his word and confirm it with him. Uh, and before we should try to teach anybody, we should be. You know, we don't want to be blind leading the blind. We need to understand the scriptures and study them and let God. And if we don't know, we need to just say, I don't know. I will look into that. But we don't want to be wrong and tell somebody wrong. Uh, if we have, we need to come back and say, hey, I think something different. Matter of fact, recently I saw something different than what I had said. It's not a major doctrine, 
But I'm going to go back and say, here's what I said. I think it might be true, but also look at this because I may have been wrong. So I think it's important that we do that, especially if we're in a position where people are looking up to us. Even though I'm not a pastor and I'm just a sister in Christ, I I understand that sometimes people do look up to me and I have a responsibility to be certain of things before I say them. And if I'm not certain, to be very clear that it's just my opinion or why I might think this way. So. If you go to Ephesians chapter four, not everyone is is uh, a minister, a preacher, uh, has a ministry in that sense. Some of us are prayer warriors. Some of us uh, do charity work. We should all be doing all the good works we can. Right. We should all be helping everyone that needs it. And if they're lost, uh, give them the gospel because that's the greatest thing ever. Uh, But. Every person should be doing all the things a Christian should do, right? But we all have specific gifts. Some people are prayer warriors. Some people actually are good at praying for the sick. Um, So let's look at Ephesians 4. I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. This is every Christian, okay? With all lowliness and meekness, with long sufferings or patience, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Okay. So every person in Christ has a vocation that we've been called into. We're told to walk worthy of that. Now he also says unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, when he he saith, he ascended us on high, he led captivity captives and gave gifts unto men. So if you go down here, it says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. That that's what I am. I'm an evangelist. And some pastors and teachers. I also do some of that. We all sometimes we're not just one area, we're in several areas. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, that's when we were, when we're resurrected in a glorified body, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Uh, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait, to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head in Christ. So every person has a vocation we're to walk worthy of. Uh, it's God's will that we all mature, right? He does, however, give some people gifts in an, in every area. Every Christian has some kind of gift. And God tells us clearly, every Christian has a vocation that we're supposed to walk worthy and give Jesus a good name, not to be saved, but as ambassadors of Christ, so that the church is blameless, so that the name of God is not blasphemed, right? To be a light unto men for a good testimony, a good witness, so that others come to saving faith in Christ. So we preach the gospel to every creature. Some of us uh, have very specific ministries. But not everyone is going to be a teacher. Not everyone is called to be a prophet or a healer or a prayer warrior. We're all told as Christians to do all these good works. But the main thing is to walk worthy of the Lord as an ambassador for Christ, ambassador of Christ, and to preach the gospel to every creature. If you start with that motive, Letting the Lord guide you through the Holy Spirit. Doors will open. Okay. Be willing to preach the gospel, to have an answer for the hope that you have. Study to show yourself approved. Spend time in the word of God. Grow in grace and walk worthy of your vocation. Telling you doors will open. Ben just told you he had no plan at all. And doors open for him. 
I don't even think he likes public speaking. But the doors were open and he went through them. So I think if you just do what the Lord puts in front of you, as, as I just said, to walk worthy, to study, to preach the gospel, that God will be faithful and open the door for you to use whatever gift he's given you. You may have a very strong pull on your heart to pray for the sick. Your ministry may open up and turn out to be a place where people just send in prayers to you and you get groups of people just to pray for the sick. There's many ways to serve the Lord. And we should all keep our eyes open for all the ways that are set before us. If God puts someone in need before us, we should do what we can to fill that need, whether it's physical or spiritual. Sometimes it may be just you giving time to that person. So just do what God commands us to do as Christians. And I believe the door will be open. Your gifts will be revealed. Just do what you're supposed to and God will open the doors for you. Okay, thank you. Well said. Uh, well, I think this is a, I, I don't recall exactly the quick questions uh, necessarily that we answered, but this is probably the most important question. Uh, it's a question every believer uh, should be uh, asking themselves and trying to get to the bottom of. Um, we all are familiar with the, the parable of the, the sower. And there are some that teach that uh, only the last seed that fell on good soil are the saved people. But um, I think all of us here agree that no, uh, only the first group are unsaved. The seed that fell by the wayside and the bird snatched it away. Um, I think we've, we agree that uh, the seed in the shallow ground, the thorny soil and the good soil are saved. <clears throat> so, but the difference is that uh, some believers uh, grow and mature and produce uh, and, and, and really uh, uh, get busy working for the Lord and producing fruit. And, and uh, um, their lives as, as Christians are successful uh, in terms of growing and maturing and being fruitful. And then uh, there are many others that their lives are really not very successful in, in any kind of ministry work. Um, not producing any fruit. They're all equally regenerated. Each, each of the seeds was sprung to life. So that means that each one of these groups of people were they're, they're regenerated, they're born again, they have the Holy Spirit. But once once you're born again, what, what next? That's a very important question. Um, and uh, I think uh, Bible Jim told me once, he says, uh, every believer should after they get saved, they need to ask God, what is it you want me to do? And then get busy doing it. And I think that was very, you know, very simple, but pro profound to find out what the Lord wants you to do and then get busy doing it. Um, okay. The, one thing, the, 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 the most important thing that we'll ever do is share the gospel. I mean, there are, there are some religions that, that think that what you got to do is feed the hungry and clothe the naked and, and all these, these things that are charitable good works. Um, and that's, that's what your priority is. But you, if, if you feed someone, but you don't feed them the, the word of God, then what have you done? You've helped them be, satisfy their hunger for a day, but then they end up going to hell because he didn't give them what they really needed, the, the bread of life. So the most important thing we'll ever do, and the first calling you have, uh, is uh, to uh, share the gospel. And everybody can do that. From, from the day that you're born again, if you understand the gospel and you get born again, then you're, you have what it is, is needed to share the gospel. You just tell them what you've come to believe and why. Uh, maybe give your testimony, as we like to say. So no matter who you are, uh, as soon as you're born again, you are qualified. And I think that, uh, you know, we're called by, by um, Jesus and Paul told us to get busy working. Jesus said, uh, don't 
Don't build up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but build up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy. Eternal treasures. And what, how do you get them? By, by serving the Lord. Every believer instantly becomes a minister. Now, a minister, it's, it's not, I'm not talking about minister as a title like uh, a, a pastor. Uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, do not think I came to be ministered to, but rather to minister and to give my life as a ransom for many. Other translations translate the word minister as servant. Don't, do not think I came to be served, but to serve. And gave, Jesus gave us examples of that, now, by, by humility and serving by washing the feet of the apostles. If he's willing to wash your feet to serve, then, then what an example to us that we should be humble and serve however we are able. Uh, but the first thing and uh, the thing that we're all qualified to do is, is uh, share the, 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 the gospel. Uh, and uh, probably the simplest way to do it is just share your own t testimony. Uh, so, and Paul says that and talks about uh, the, the judgment seat of Christ for the believers, how our, our ministry will be judged. See, from the day you're, you're born again to your last breath, uh, a record's being kept of what you did for the cause of Christ. And uh, you will be rewarded, gold, silver, precious gems. Uh, and, uh, and some of the things we do will be burned up as wood, hay, hay and stubble because uh, either it was not of any value or perhaps the motivation was wrong. You did it for the wrong reason. But um, we, we should keep busy. So you need to find out what does God want me to do and then get busy uh, doing it. Uh, now, uh, apart from the gospel, sharing the gospel, uh, there's many other, many callings. Uh, uh, Renee mentioned uh, uh, Maybe some or, or, or all of them, but uh, what are you called to do? Um, I, I think the best way to find out is there's two things that could be helpful. Uh, perhaps you've been given a talent in life. Maybe you have a gift for music. Uh, well, if, if you know that you're, you've already been singing and playing instruments and doing that, then, then why not bring that gift? And then maybe that's the gift that God gave you to use for the church. Uh, the Bible says that the body is, has hands. Well, that maybe you're someone that has to is, is supposed to be the hands and get busy uh, working. And maybe you need to sweep up the floor and put away the chairs at the end of the church service. Uh, feet, maybe you're called to travel for the cause of Christ. Uh, mouths, uh, maybe you're the one that's supposed to be the, 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 the speaker or the teacher. Uh, but I, I'd say that uh, two things that you, to find out what you're called to do, well, some of us know our, our gifts. I, I knew that my gift in life was to teach, and I, that, that's my degree. I'm, I have a degree in education, and I've taught. It's before I was saved, I taught uh, various subjects. And uh, so I thought the natural thing for me to do was take the talent that I had and, and see if I can use it. I, I I'd already given at least 10,000 public speeches in my life before I got saved. And so if I'm a public speaker, uh, why not speak for the Lord? What greater thing to speak to speak about? So I started street preaching. Uh, but you should tr try all the different things. Be the feet, be the hands, be the mouth. Do uh, Fill all those roles, and then maybe you'll discover which is one that you're really supposed to focus on but i think even though uh maybe I'm, I'm called to teach and speak but uh if there's another need and it's not my gift i should be willing to fill in the fill the void even though well i'm not really talented in that but it needs to be done so let's not say hey it's not my gift no let's, let's just do the best we can until the person who's really talented in that area come, becomes available um, so I guess, let me see, the question is, uh, um, how do you know what you're called to do? I guess those, that's what would be my, my advice to find out uh, what your calling is. But the main thing is get busy doing it. And even if you make some mistakes, you will learn along the way, but at least by, by doing. 
Um, okay, Renee or, or Ben, any more on this? Just, you know, uh, I think it's important that when we want to serve the Lord, that we really, we really need to remember it's about him and always keep in mind it, you know, is this what, is it for the Lord? Just always keep our motives in check, uh, not to condemn, because, but to keep our hearts open to service that may not be, uh, they may not be very glorious or they may be, um, uh, remember, it's not about what man sees you doing. You know, Jesus said, if you give a glass of cold water to one of my brethren, it's going to be remembered. So there's nothing small to God when you're showing love or kindness. Just remember, nothing is too small. Any act of love or kindness is remembered. One last thing I remember that um, uh, let's let's say that um, you need to um, get busy immediately doing something, but slow down. It may sound like a contradiction. But no, let's start doing some find and, and even if it's uh, not your calling, get busy doing it. But I would caution everybody, uh, when it's particularly when it comes to teaching. I've seen this happen so many times where people uh, are too eager to be a teacher. There's something about being a teacher that maybe appeals to our egos and, and that uh, we want to teach. Um, but I would say that if you have not uh, studied, for many years, uh, you should not be teaching. Uh, so just spend your time learning, and uh, uh, at some point, maybe you'll qualify to teach. Isn't there a verse? Maybe you can remember uh, where this is, someone, but uh, I think there's a verse that's a cautionary telling us that uh, if you're a teacher, be careful because uh, you, you have a greater uh, responsibility. Yeah, we'll, be more, we'll re receive a stricter judgment. Let there not be many teachers. I don't know the address of that verse particularly, but yeah. So I would say that uh, if you've been just got saved and the months or just in the last year or so, uh, I would I would say really really slow down. And uh, even though you're eager to serve, find some other way to serve, and don't be don't try to start teaching too soon. Oh, well, that's a good point. Yeah, it says be not many masters. Uh, so well, if you God will elevate you. God will elevate you. You, you. you shouldn't be too quick to you get saved. You think you got some understanding. Now you want to go be teachers of everyone else. And uh, I tell you, it was years, years of fear, years of asking God. And I stuck to certain things because I knew soteriology was the most important. So I made sure that I understood everything about that doctrine. and. I made clear to people, I, look, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a theologian. I will try to answer if I can. But I have seen people get saved. And then a couple months later, they're out teaching people. And then I've seen people start a ministry of teaching. And then they're, they're teaching wrong because all they're doing is listening to one or two preachers they like and just copying everything they hear instead of actually taking time in the scriptures and letting God show them. So I, I think that's really important. Let God elevate you. Don't, don't lift yourself up into a position, but just serve God the way we're supposed to live the way you're supposed to. Then God will elevate you. It says that clearly because there is, a, and, and I, and I fear, I don't ever, I tell you guys, check everything I say, because I don't want anybody uh, to be taught wrong or, for me to mislead in any way, because there is a warning, be not many masters, because it is a greater judgment on us, because everyone under us, we're responsible for those people. And so I think that's a really good point Luke made. Don't get saved and then jump right into teaching. You need to spend years and time letting the Lord show you in the scriptures what his word says. All right. Yeah, didn't okay. Paul didn't Paul spend a good uh, ten years or more 
uh, studying, you know, communing with God yep. before he start, he went out. Yep, fourteen years he he went out. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I hope that was helpful to everybody because that was a very important and a profound question that uh, needed to be uh, answered. Uh, all right. I guess it's time now for us to start finishing up. Um, um, ben, well, I'll have you go last so that you can uh, read the exhortation that uh, Brother Hendricks submitted. And uh, uh, I'd like to give the gospel message today. So, uh, Renee, can we start with you? Could you give us a, a summary of uh, what you thought of the, the time today? Yeah, I was very happy to hear that Hendricks uh, is sent in an exhortation. Praise the Lord. Um, the questions were very important, especially, I mean, all of them. You know, the ones about soteriology are the utmost importance, uh, uh, clarity on how to be saved. But, you know, wanting to know what our gifts are and our calling. Someone asked, what's the difference between a gift and a calling? Well, the God gives us gifts so we can perform our calling. So the gifts is what God equips us with so that we can do what God calls us to do. And as a Christian, every person has the calling to preach the gospel. Every Christian has the calling to walk worthy of the name of Christ and to be an ambassador for Christ. We should remember that. It's not just about, well, how much sin can we do and still be saved? It's not about that. It's we are saved. So how can we serve the Lord with gratitude? How can I walk in my identity? What is my purpose God has for my life? And then that's how we have a much more fulfilled life. And uh, I, I think these are simple but important issues that we discuss today. Hey, Renee, I, I noticed that... Uh... You stole uh, that idea about uh, subscribe and share and Did I? and, and uh, uh, like and all that. Uh, I stole it you... for her. I, I, oh, I did. I did the thieving. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> you didn't know it. I, I I guess he put it on. Are you talking about Thursdays? Yes. Yeah. Yes, he ran it beginning of Thursdays program. That's right. That's, that was wonderful. So maybe Renee, we can ask you then to explain that the. I, why are we putting this up at the beginning and the end of each program? Uh, subscribe, like, uh, I think notifica that notification and share. Yeah, if you, if the more somebody likes or even dislikes something, it brings it up higher on an algorithm list so that when people do searches, the channel or the videos will be recommended quicker. They'll be put at a higher list the more people it's interesting though it's like the more people see it the more they'll promote it for other people to see it or something like that mm -hmm. well what i'm going to do right now oh there it is thumbs up thumbs up i just gave us a thumbs up and uh i just did too i'm glad you reminded everybody hit the thumbs up like thing if you, if you liked it if you don't don't lie just put thumbs and, down. and it, it, if you have not subscribed to the uh, ces uh, channel please subscribe to it and there's a bell there. If you click on that, you'll be notified of all the programs coming up. And then finally, uh, if you if you like any of our programs and, and you have someone you would think would be benefit, then share it and send it to them. All right. Um, OK, um, let me see. Ben, yeah, you're going to have you give the exhortation last. So let me. Uh, well, one of the things that we did recently, too, is um, we tried to uh, ex express the gospel, the, 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 the main point that we think are essential a person understand and believe, and try to, to, try to condense it and, and simplify as much as possible. So I, I'm asked, well, can, is it possible to express it in just one sentence? And, uh, and this is what we came up with. And you, you'll see this uh, on, on all of our programs now, it's uh, it, on the screen with all the other things you see pop up on the screen that are uh, what we call truisms. So this is the, the gospel message, uh, the content of the gospel message in just one sentence. It says, God became a man, Jesus Christ, and he died on the cross to pay for all our sins and was raised bodily from the dead to guarantee the gift of eternal life and heaven. To all who believe that Christ alone provides salvation 
and eternal life through faith in him alone. Now, I know that if you were asked to put the gospel message in, into fewer words as possible, uh, you, you might express it a little differently, but that's what we came up with. Uh, so th when it comes to sharing the gospel, it doesn't have to be, uh, uh, you know, an hour long. I often I, see, I come across a video that says the gospel, and I first thing I look for is how long is it, uh, and if it's, a lot of them are an hour or two hours long, and I'm thinking, oh no, that's a bad sign. If it's that long, then it's probably going to be a, a workspace system. <laughs> if it's the if it's the simple gospel, it should it could be a matter of just minutes. Um, so I would say I also put together a. Um, a gospel tract that you know, you can copy and 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 use to give out to, as a tract. And this is this is what I came up with. It says, "Are you certain that you're going to go to heaven and have eternal life? If so, why?" So this is what I learned many years ago. Uh, right after I got saved, I took a class called Evangelism Explosion, and this is one of the the, the, the tenets of that uh, program. They say you start off with a diagnostic question. That is, let's diagnose the person. Let's try to determine if they're saved or not. And the only thing we can go by is, is what do you believe? So we, we want to know, are you certain you're going to go to heaven? And, and if you are certain, why? Based on what? When you ask most people that question, they they will say, well, I'm, I'm not certain I'm I hope so. I got my fingers crossed, and uh, I'm doing the best. Uh, and the reason is, uh, I, I, well, I'm a pretty good person. They think that salvation is somehow determined by personal merit. Uh, so they'll say, "Well, I, I go to church. I, I, I try to follow the golden rule, and you know, I, I, I uh, give to charity, and I, I, I." They're trying to justify their salvation based upon something that they are doing for God instead of what God has done for them. Um, so um, what, what does the Bible say about this, though? Uh, I'll start off with uh, Romans 10.3. It says, For they don't understand that Christ has died to make them right with God. Instead, they are trying to make themselves good enough to gain God's favor by keeping the laws and customs. But that is not God's way of salvation. But this is the way of the world. The world as a whole, if you ask them, in fact, all the religions of the world are based on this premise, that uh, uh, if, if you make yourselves pleasing to God, then, then uh, that's how you get to go to heaven, if, you, if you're good enough. Uh, but that's not God's way. Uh, what is God's way? Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So we know that our salvation is not earned through personal merit, through our religious works, our own righteousness, our own goodness. Uh, instead, it's a gift that we can receive from God through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, faith in the person of Christ, Believing who he is, believing what he's uh, what he's accomplished for us, believing his promise to us. Uh, so salvation is not earned through personal merit, but is a gift from Jesus Christ. Uh, and then let's look at Romans three twenty three. If a person thinks that they're good, let's let's put an end to that because Romans three twenty says twenty three says, "For all have sinned." and come short of the glory of God. Well, I believe that the glory of God uh, is uh, Jesus Christ himself. I think the, the, the life that Jesus lived was the standard that you have to meet if you want to go to God and say, look at all the wonderful works I did in your name. I did this and I did that. In fact, Jesus warns that there's going to come a time where people come before him and say, look at all the wonderful works we did in your name. And, but Jesus says, no, that's not what satisfies me. Um, that these are works of iniquity. In other words, your works have no value uh, uh, because what really you need is faith in him. 
And, and, then, and then we look at Romans 6.23. It says, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in Romans 3.20 says, says, we've all sinned. And in Romans 6.23 says, sin, the result of it, the wages, what we get for it is death. But fortunately, it says the gift of God is eternal life. Instead of death, you get life everlasting with, when you have your faith entirely in Jesus. Now, a lot of people think that there's many ways to get to heaven. Look at all the great religions of the world. Look at all the good people who are following these various religions. Uh, so, you know, Christianity, is, well, that's good for you, but, you know, not everybody has to be Christian. Well, Jesus says that's not the case. Uh, in John one twenty nine, Jesus says, uh, I'm sorry, um, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, he's pointing and talking about Jesus, says, which taketh away the sin of the world. Mark 10, 45 says, he's talking about Jesus. He came to give his life a ransom for many. A ransom is a payment made to set someone else free. free. His death, his suffering and shed blood and death on the cross was a ransom payment to set you free from condemnation. Uh, and then John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there's there's going to be two groups of people uh, in eternity, and one is the, a group that perishes, and the other is a group that has eternal life, life everlasting. If you want life everlasting, you've got to believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, to get it. And then finally, Jesus says, there's no other way. He says in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. C.S. Lewis talked about this verse, and he said that imagine someone claiming that if you want to go to heaven, I'm the way to get there. In fact, I'm not only the way, but I'm the only way. There is no other way. And C.S. Lewis says, imagine the, 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 the arrogance of someone making such a claim. Jesus, that's what Jesus claimed. He said, it, he's the way to get to heaven. And he said, I see, he's the only way. So C.S. Lewis says, well, because Jesus claimed that, you only have three possible ways to, under, to interpret that. Either Jesus was insane. Like a person that thinks they're a hard-boiled egg or Napoleon. Uh, was he insane? Uh, or Jesus was a liar. He knew he was not really the way to heaven. He knew that he's not the only way, but he claimed to be that anyway. And if that's the case, he would be evil, lying about such a thing. And then the third possibility is he is who he claimed to be, the only Savior. And then uh, we look at uh, uh, John eleven twenty five and 26. It says, Jesus said unto her, speaking to uh, uh, Mary after uh, the death of, uh, of uh, Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? That's what he asked Mary. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you will have everlasting life but because of Jesus? And then the question that's asked directly in the Bible about what, you, what do you have to do? If you want to go to heaven, what is required of you? Acts 16, 30, 31 says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What could be more direct and, and, and blunt as that? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Now, you notice that Paul did not answer. Uh, um, well, believe in Jesus and get water baptized and repent of your sins and change your life and give to charity and follow all the commandments and on and on and on. No. He simply said, believe on Jesus. I like to, to say that believing on Jesus means that you're depending on Jesus. You're relying on Jesus. It's not about you. You're trusting that Jesus is going to get you to heaven. 
because he's able and he's faithful. Um, and then it says, uh, and I give unto them eternal life. I'm sorry. Uh, that, uh, uh, John 10, 28 says, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. This verse is important for us to understand that when we believe in Jesus, we get eternal life and no one can change it. It's settled. It's permanent. It's irrevocable. It's irreversible. What we call eternal security. And that's the name of this congregation, the church of the eternally secure. And then finally, what Paul says in Romans 8, 38, 39, um, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a wonderful verse to give us the confidence that, that nothing, I mean, Paul made quite a list there, all these things, nothing can undo the salvation that we have, that we will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Well, I think that's what we would call the gospel. The gospel is a Greek word. It means good news. But we should really think of it as the greatest news ever. And if you understand this simple message, and, and if you believe it, if, if you believe it applies to you, if you believe Jesus is God, you believe he did pay for your sins. You believe he was raised from the dead for your justification. So you can be confident that he is God. He is the savior. He does have power over life and death. And he gives you eternal life as a promise. And it's guaranteed to you if you trust him for it. I hope you do. Okay. Okay, are, you, are, you, are we ready for the exhortation? Yes, I am, brother. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and that was a great gospel presentation, by the way. Um, and I think it's important to preach the gospel not only to the saved, but not only to the unsaved, but to the saved as well. Um, so this is from uh, Brother Hendricks, sent it in. And, I, and Hendricks, in the future, I think it'd be great if you, if you would, actually, if you wanted to, record if it, just your voice, and, and I can provide an upload lo location so we can hear your voice read this to us. Um, but I'll read it today. And um, so it, it, this is a courtesy of Brother Hendricks. It says, he starts off with by quoting Nehemiah 6, 9, which reads, For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hand shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. That's Nehemiah 6, 9. And then uh, Hendricks says, Recently, many of us had have been quite disheartened that every time you check the news, your beliefs or actions are lambasted, while those of another persuasion are totted up. Yes, many of us are discouraged to set out or finish the work God has set before us, so much so that we may find even brethren tell us to brethren telling us to give up and that it's all futile. The truth is, what God has said will be done, and the words and lies of man can only hinder us if we let them. Way back in Nehemiah, where the Jews had returned to Jerusalem, they found the walls of the city to be practically rubble. But Nehemiah himself prayed unto God to bless this great endeavor he was about to start, which was the building of the walls and gates of, the, of Jerusalem and started on his good work. Aside from the actual difficulties of construction and repairing the walls and gates, the children of Israel found opposition from the heathen like Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arabian, and the rest of Israel's enemies. When those men heard the endeavor of the Jews, they were furious and mocked the Jews. Soon enough, they conspired together to fight and hinder Jerusalem. Stop me if you've heard this, but the lies being spread by them were so frequent and so loudly proclaimed, even the people of Judah 
told their brethren that there is no way they could build, rebuild the wall, that their adversaries are so great, and that they would all be slain, that their enemies would be upon them before they could even realize what happened. Talk about demoralizing. But what did Nehemiah do? When he heard the anger and the mockery of the adversaries of Israel, he prayed unto God and encouraged the people. When he had heard their enemies conspire to fight against Jerusalem, he prayed unto God and set up a guard for the builders. When his own brethren came repeating the words of their enemies, Nehemiah armed with everyone and said, I'm sorry, when his own brethren came repeating the words of their enemies, Nehemiah armed everyone and said, Be not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your houses. And it came to pass their enemies saw God, brought their evil plans to naught, and the builders of Israel returned to their work in peace and with vigilance. Finally, the enemies of Israel sent messengers of peace to Nehemiah, seeking a private meeting with Nehemiah, but secretly seeking to murder him. But Nehemiah declined message after message with a wise and honest reply. Quote, I am not going, I am doing a great work and cannot stop it to meet with you. Unquote. In the end, the walls and gates of Jerusalem were restored when their enemies heard of this, uh, I'm sorry, heard of it, they were quite de depressed and knew that the restoration of the walls was of God. So what's all this to do with us today? What you hear on the TV, what is told to you from the powers that be, the, from principalities, what wrath, what trickery, what censorship, God says, quote, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee, and the right hand of my righteousness, unquote. The work God has prefer prepared for us to walk in, no matter what others may say or do, remember the work has been blessed by God, and he will see it finished. And then he, find, he finishes off with Galatians 6, verses 9 through 10. And let us not be weary in, do in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And that was a wonderful exhortation, and it, it fits so well with uh, a lot of things that were said earlier today. So thank you, uh, Brother Hendricks. Amen. It was. Amen. Yeah. That was really great. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, well, that's the uh, end of our, our service for today. This is Sunday, so let me see. I guess, uh, Ben, you get to enjoy Monday and Tuesday off, huh? Take a break from all the producing you're doing? Yeah, but it's my weekend, I guess. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. Good, you said the well-deserved rest. But then we'll be back on uh, Wednesday for the Wednesday Night Bible Study at 9.30 Eastern Time on this same channel. And then, don't forget, this Thursday, I'm really excited. Renee's got uh, Chris and Date on, and uh, they're going to be talking about eternal torment or not. And so you don't want to miss that. Uh, all right. Thank you, Renee and Ben, and thank you, everybody in the chat room. Thank you especially to the moderators and the de who are the deacons in the chat room. Thank you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>